Jesus. All the glory, honor, and praise. Blessings unto him and him alone. And in agreement with that, we all said together, amen. Amen and amen. All right, God bless you this morning. You can be seated in the name of Jesus, in his presence. You're blessed today. You are blessed today. Yes, amen. Rich in him, full in him. And I pray God shift your state. I just pray that I can't, I can't help but I keep hearing grace and peace be multiplied. You look up Caris and you look up Irene, or we say Irene, where you get serene from. That's the Greek word peace. Well, I'm telling you, if that's multiplied, you're in for some amazing blessing. It's flood tides, more than you can ask or think. Good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over shell, men give. And we rejoice. If men can give that way, how much more the Father gives that way. You're blessed today. So receive of his peace. Let all your cares be nailed to the tree. That's where they belong. Yet they don't belong. Listen to me. If it's on the tree, it ain't on me. And if it's in the grave, I'm not a slave. Praise God. You agree with that? All right. To our stewardship report. God bless you. As of this morning, we have $7,410. And this is the last Sunday. We have Wednesday night to make budgets. So that's about twenty-five ninety. So we're only about $90 behind where we need to be today. And we rejoice in that. We thank God. Much better month than the last two. And uh, God sustains and blesses us. So, but we do need a good day. Uh, the grass is due this week. The mortgage, which is a, a meager 3800 is due. Ouch. And you know the sad thing about the mortgage is it comes up every 30 days. They never let us take a break. They don't give you holidays, breaks. It comes up every 30 days. And we are richly blessed. And over the 10 years we've had this mortgage, we've never missed one. Not one. Never been late. And we're thankful for that. And we praise God for it. So we are preparing to give now as you prepare your tithe and offering. Go ahead and stand with me. And we rejoice in that. Let's go to the vision, please. And let's agree. Let's just make this our bold confession before the Lord and before one another. Now let's go back to the mission, please. Let's say it together. We're a family church, a Bible training center. We're changing Lancaster, South Carolina, and we're excited about Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Our vision is Jesus Christ. Our mission is to preach, teach, and exalt the Lord Jesus Christ in all the fullness of his glory and power and to radiate his love to our community and unto all the world. Amen. Did you know this morning you're radioactive? There's something glowing in you. There's something of another realm coming out of you, making you absolutely deadly to the curse and deadly to this realm of death and curse. You have some great, great anointing working in you because of Jesus. We agree with that. All right, Father, thank you now. You always bless, you always supply, your good. And you bless this house through your people. And you bless the people as they continually give themselves to you. I thank you and praise you. You make us rich in every dimension, spiritually, mentally, physically, socially, and financially. Abraham was rich in goods and cattle, silver, and gold. I thank you. I'm increased in goods. I thank you that I have the best, drive the best, wear the best because you love me. Because you love me. And because you bless me. And not only that, but Lord, you anoint me to give the best. Can you hear that? He anoints me. See, he gives me the best, but then he anoints me to give the best. And to sow of the tithe offered in alms. And we thank you, Lord. Blessing today on our finances, on your people, in every dimension. Strengthen them, encourage them. And I thank you, Lord. Again, our cares are taken from us, nailed to the tree, put away. We give you all the glory for increase. Colossians 2.19 says that as nourishment is ministered to the church, we increase with the increase of God. I'm believing God for the increase of God. I just don't want to increase. It matters what's increasing. You know, in the natural, you don't want your waistline increasing. There's some stuff you don't want increasing. So it, it matters in the spirit what's increasing. I want to increase with the increase of God. And we all know one of Brother Richard's favorite scriptures. We must decrease. He must increase. That's the increase we want. Oh, more grace, more of Jesus, more of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We give you glory and honor. Give you much praise today. Thank you. In Jesus' name, we said together, amen.
All right, let's fellowship together, love one another, and obey God in your finances this morning. back to your seat if you'll just remain standing. Hey, good morning, Mr. Dolores. I appreciate Mr. Dolores' devotion this morning. To be spirit-filled, the next dimension of that is to be spirit-thrilled. Because I know a lot of spirit-filled folk that ain't spirit-thrilled folk, so we're going to the next realm. All right, let's go to the announcements, please. And we will just make mention of a few things. We have some uh, things concerning the shoebox ministry. Our teens are collecting the shoebox and items. The goal this year is 50. Deadline's December 6th when we're going to gather the boxes. And as late as the night, uh, early in the afternoon, which that's a Wednesday, video presentation will be October 11th. And uh, Feed the Hungry Workers are needed, so please sign the sheet in the foyer to sign up. And let me know there'll be a meeting uh, next Sunday right after church for a few minutes. That is necessary. We're going to need as many people as we can have for the feed, the hungry. We want to bless the community. And those dates will be October 9th, December 4th, our work weekend coming up. We need some things inside and out in the building. Those of you that I asked to prepare your list, please make sure I have your list by next Sunday. Those of you that were in the meeting over here, uh, I've got my list ready. I see some things we need to do. So we look around painting that needs to be done, touching up, and we're going to get together and get all of the Lord's house beautified together. Fall conference five weeks from today, so we're 35 days out, and uh, we're asking God for abundant favor. That is our celebration of tabernacles. We're inviting all the ministry and partners in, and we pray that many are planning to come. All will be able to come, and God is going to uh, give us a rich, rich time this year in our conference. Can you agree with that? The first thing you do to have a great conference, I've got to learn this because that's a lot of pressure. To host one is a lot harder than preaching one because you're responsible for everything. It all falls back on me first and then I delegate it. But I'd rather preach 
10 than host 1. So the first thing I need to do is quit saying that. Because I'm opposing myself, see. I'm opposing myself. You see, I just made conference that much harder with my big mouth. We're going to learn something before we leave today. So praise God. What a privilege to host a conference. Praise God. What a privilege to have it here. What a privilege to have choice ministry come from around the country. And praise God. First thing the Lord said this year for conference. First thing I want you to do is rest. Instead of saying, oh, it's hard to host a conference. We don't realize how often we oppose the Lord. All right. We're going to get that straight. Uh, youth will be going to Charlotte. Uh, that's, a, that's a Wednesday, December 9th, to help with the shoeboxes there at Samaritan's Purse. And we'll give you details on that. All right. And then we're praying for Larry Miller and family and brothers and sisters in extension. And we love Larry. Larry's a great man of God. And Larry is a preacher of the gospel. He's got so much more in him. And he's allowed to come out so far. But we're praying for him. We agree with him that he's the blessed of the Lord. I appreciate you. I appreciate you being here. It's a dark, dreary, rainy, old, wet Sunday. And it would have been a good day to pull the covers up and sleep. But you made the choice to come to the house of the Lord. So. see you here. This is a special time of us to come together just to fellowship. The secret sister thing, I don't know if that's still going to be done today, but that's for those that want to participate in that. It doesn't mean that that's what this tea is all about. The tea is to bring us together, bring our hearts together so that we can fellowship and just love one another. We need this, ladies. So I hope to see all of y'all here today at 4 o'clock. Amen. Amen. Can I give a testimony? Sure. This, this past weekend, we were away. We went for a wedding. <clears throat> Those of you that know, um, Brian and Jenny that come for conference, pastor's best friend, my best friend, they met through us and started dating, and, and they were our maid of honor and best man and then they ended up getting married they had two daughters and uh, one of them got married last weekend so that's why we were there but we had the privilege of staying with my parents so we got to see them and uh, for those of you that know and those of you that do ask and keep them in prayers know the situation that happened with my, my dad having the spinal cord stroke to give an update on him. He is doing so good. And, you know, Mom said, you're going to be uh, shocked when you see how well he's doing. And I said, no, Mom, I'm not going to be shocked because I'm expecting it. Amen. I've been believing for 110% with his health. I said, you're going to be better. You're going to be better than you were before it ever happened. And he looks great. He's doing good. Um, he is... Uh, been having the therapy. He's moving parts of his hand. They started this week on his shoulder to be able, the right arm, to be able to lift because he hadn't been able to do that. And um, But I'm believing it's all coming back. And he is just doing so good. And I just thank you for your prayers and the encouragement that y'all have had for them. And I just thank you for that. And it was a joy last Sunday when we went to church with them. We're standing there and Pop was on the end, and my mom and me and Pastor, and y'all know how he is. Um, he's always pretty much up here and never having the opportunity to be in the seat. Well, he's doing just like he's doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> I said, you be a participator and not a spectator. But we were worshiping the Lord, and they had just an awesome flow of the Spirit there with their team. They have a lot of different... Teams there, talent is just coming out. The, but um, we were worshiping the Lord, and you know, I had my eyes closed, and I would worship, and then I'd open them up, you know, and things. And I caught something moving over here to my left, and I said, "What in the world is that?" And Mama, she's worshiping, you know, and and I was like, instead of just looking down there like that, I was like, "Okay," I saw it again. It was just doing this, just a going. And I 
Okay. That was Pop. He's over there. He's just going to town, praising the Lord. And I told him at lunch, I said, buddy, you're going to be dangerous when you get both of them going. But uh, I just give God praise because he is doing better. Ladies, I'll see you at 4 o'clock today. Thank you. All right. All right. Praise God. The difference between a healing and a miracle, a miracle is instantaneous. I didn't get a miracle out of where I was, but praise God, I'm healed. Amen. Gene didn't get an instantaneous miracle, but he is healed and being made whole. And uh, I apologize. I, I thought I put that on the board um, about the ladies' tea. I wouldn't slight you ladies for anything and pray you have a wonderful time this afternoon. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Now we're ready to open our hearts to your word. You have blessed us. You have graced us with your presence. So I'm praying today, grace and peace be multiplied to us today. As Smith Wigglesworth prophesied, the flood tide of blessing. The flood tide is here. And we're in the flood. We're not just in the flow. We're in the flood. Heirs of God. Join heirs with Christ. <laughs> let your word come with a boldness, a freedom. And let it pierce our heart. Let it change our thought. Let it radically shift our state. Confirm it with signs following. In the name of your Son, the Son of God, Jesus, be glorified. Our hearts changed, and we thank you. In every class, children and young people, we are blessed together, anointed, appointed, ordained to bring forth fruit in this generation, and we give you praise. And in agreement with that, we all said together, Amen. Amen. All right, children, young people, you may go. If you're in the auditorium, you can be seated. There will be classes for all ages, and the staff will help you once you get back there. God bless you. All right, let's go to Romans chapter 8. Verse 11 through 17. Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. That should bring a shout. That should bring joy and rejoicing. We are so richly blessed because of Jesus. Romans chapter 8, there are 39 verses in the chapter. There are 39 books in the Old Covenant. I've been studying Romans 8 extensively now for a few weeks and will continue to do so as our Wednesday night study will parallel with this and take us to the eighth day, which is living in Romans 8. There are 39 books in the Old Covenant and I'm finding out that the answer for Genesis, because Adam put you in condemnation, Romans 8, 1 will answer the dilemma of Genesis. There's no condemnation. In Exodus, the people were in bondage to Pharaoh. Romans 8, 2 is the answer to Exodus, for now we've been made free from the law of sin and death by the law of life in Christ. Leviticus, the law comes and was given to the priesthood. Romans 8, 3 for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son. That's the answer for the book of Leviticus is Romans 8, 3. Romans 8, 4. When they begin to break the law and violate the law, fiery serpents came among the camp. Look at that. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. That's the answer for the fiery serpents and all the law breaking. His righteousness is fulfilled in us. God confirmed it in us. And if you go through, and I'm going through the books of the Old Covenant, and that's perfect. I know it is because only God could write a perfect book. I've known for a long time my Bible's perfect, and that's why I pray earnestly, diligently, Lord, give wisdom, understanding, teach me. I know you're the best teacher. Help me to be the best student. Give me wisdom. I want to learn. You know, a good student, I've, I've taught a lot now through the years, and I've taught in Bible college, and when I teach in Bible college, it's for a degree. It's actually a degree program. So uh, they're there because they're paying to be there. They're there to get an education and a revelation and a degree that hopefully will help them and empower them in places of ministry. That's all degrees do. You know, really, if you want to know the truth, everybody's got 98.6 degrees. That's what you need first. And if you got that, if you got 98.6 degrees, we could work with you from there. You need 98.6 degrees to get moving. Well, anyway, and I've noticed the best students are diligent. They apply themselves 
and they do the homework and they're willing to do what is required. And God, God does have some invitation and instruction. Come, take my yoke upon you, learn of me. And so that's what we're doing. We're learning and growing. And we will just over the next year or so get this subject and get it down deep. As the prophecy came this morning, the word for now, heirs of God and join heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. If we will get this word and let this word be established and let God establish us in this word, then I really believe that our lives are going to shift and we will not be going back to lesser realms anymore. We will not be looking to things that are behind. Hebrews chapter 11 said, if they had been mindful of that which they came out of, they would have had opportunity to go back. And there comes a place where you can no longer be mindful of what you came out of. You've got to let it go. And turn your face toward the Lord and let's move on, walk on and minister with him. And he is going to multiply and bless and strengthen. So I honor you today as saints of God. I call you students of grace. Good students get their studies. Good students do their homework. Good students will take their books home and do more than what is required. This is not a Sunday message. It's a life message. Change you. It's what we are. It's how we live. It's who we are in Christ. I'm so thankful today for where God has us, where he's brought us to, that we're standing, we're believing, and we're rejoicing. I keep hearing in the realm of spirit, the flood tide is here. Grace and peace be multiplied. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and him who called you to glory and virtue. All right, Romans 8, 11. If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall quicken your mortal body by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live after the flesh. If ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye... Do mortify the deeds of the body through the Spirit. You shall live. That word is zeo there. It's akin to zoe, but it's zeo. You shall live. And it literally means to be full of vigor, energized. It means to be overflowing with vitality. Gentlemen, you and I have a right to believe God for Abraham's blessing. And his body was rejuvenated at 99. And he became strong and healthy. Ladies, you've a right to Sarah's blessing. Your daughters of Sarah at 90, God made her so attractive that an ungodly worldly king wanted her. Someone told me one time, well, that king was just looking at her through spiritual eyes. That king didn't have no spiritual eyes. That king was as ungodly as the day is long. Wouldn't know God if he run into him at Walmart in a red coat and a green hat. He didn't know God. He wasn't looking at her with spiritual eyes. He was looking at her as a woman. And he wanted her. Now, ladies, believe that. Gentlemen, believe that. You're restored and your body renewed. Your youth renewed like the eagles. You shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. What's the earth groaning for? Manifestation of the sons of God. How's that going to happen? Being led by the Spirit. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of bondage. That's not yours. Any spirit that genders bondage, you've not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry. In the book of Galatians chapter 4, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, if we look at Galatians 4, the spirit's crying, Abba, Father. In Romans 8, we're crying, Abba, Father. The spirit and the bride say, the spirit and the bride say, come. I'm crying Abba today because the spirit in me is confirming I'm a son of God. Amen. Cleansed and washed, redeemed and free, blessed, anointed, appointed, ordained. That's who God says I am. I'm rejoicing today. So the spirit then bearing witness with our spirit, we are children of God, heirs of God, and join heirs with Christ. If we so be, we suffer with him, we shall also reign together with him. What a word. So let's just get our rejoicing this morning. If you are children, are you children this morning? Children of God. You know, I've had some people call me everything but a child of God. Huh. <laughs> Krista and I were having a discussion. She'd have a difficulty with somebody this week and her and I were talking. And she didn't have very many good things to say about this person. And I started saying, let's bless them. Let's have some fun. Let's bless them. Let's bless them. Let's pray for them that despitefully use us. 
You know how Chris is. Diddy. 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 And I kept on. I just wouldn't quit. I kept on and kept on and kept on and kept on. And I said, sweetheart, I've had people call me everything, even but a child of God, but I'm going to bless them anyway. But if you're children of God, I'm calling you children of God today. Children of God, then you're heirs of God. And you are joint heirs with Jesus Christ, which means you're co-owner, which means everything that's his is yours. And that's in the Holy Writ. That's not some man-made doctrine, ideology, or theology. That is not my interpretation. That's what God said. Now, it would do us well and to be wise to find out what that means. Heirs of God and join heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to great lengths here to show you what belongs to Jesus and how that applies to you. So the first blessing of the Son is that He is affirmed by the Father. Whether He was in Jordan, which is about a thousand feet below sea level, or on the mountain of Transfiguration, which is about nine thousand feet above sea level, in the low place or the high place, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. This is my Son, hear Him. And God confirms me in the low places of life or in the high places. His affirmation does not and cannot change. He has spoken with his heart. He has written by his spirit. He has decreed with his mouth. And it is so. Let there be an amen in your heart to the word of the Lord concerning you. The affirmation upon Jesus was given to us. So here are our thoughts here in the gospel of affirmation. Christ is affirmed and confirmed by the Father. Number two, the cross finished our disfavor, our disgrace, and our discredit. That has been done. Jesus bore all of my sin. Jesus bore all of my death. He bore all of my curse. I'm not going to hurry today. If you'll help, we'll get, by. We'll get through a lot quicker. He bore all the curse, my curse. He ended my disfavor so that God could begin his favor. Everything that was legally mine through Adam's transgression was accredited and deposited to and for Jesus. And he bore the brunt and the full consequences of all that was mine on the tree and for three days and three nights. Do you believe that? The death side of redemption. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale, so must, must the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth three days and three nights. What a journey Jesus took, died our death on the cross, and then took the journey that was rightfully ours. Jonah was in the belly of the whale for his disobedience, and Jesus was in the belly of the whale for your disobedience. A greater than Jonah's here. But Jesus is not dead. He lives. He's alive. He's Lord of all, reigns forever. And therefore, we're rejoicing that our, our disfavor is over. We are now children in the family. And it's important, you know, that you're born again, not of corruptible, but incorruptible seed by the word of God. And the word of God lives. That's Jesus. Where does he live? He lives in the heavens and he abides. Where does he abide? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. He lives in the heavens, abides in my heart, that Christ may dwell in your heart by faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. So we're children of the family. And then we are called to full stature, the fullness of the measure, the stature of Christ, and to favor God has called you son or daughter. Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed on us that we should be called sons of God. And there's hope in his calling. He's called you by your name. He's called you according to his faith and by his word. And you must learn to agree with what God says about you. You are made accepted in the beloved. And as Mary was blessed and highly favored from a word from the angel Gabriel, the messenger, Hail, thou art blessed and highly favored. I say to you from the word of the Lord, Hail, thou art blessed and highly favored. For in you is the Christ. In you is the Lord Jesus. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his. But you have the spirit of Christ. And there is an overshadowing presence, a glory about you. For Jesus himself, the King and the Lord of all, lives in you. Praise God. We're blessed today. Then our confidence and faith must rest in Jesus who is. 
And we will never say I am. If we say I am without saying he is, we get off into arrogance, pride, and what some would call spiritual narcissism or a superior race. So what Hitler propagated was narcissism was a superior race. That the German people and the Aryan nation were superior to all other and all others were inferior and must be exterminated. That's what Hitler propagated and he did so through some of the scriptures of the New Testament taken out of context. Always remember this. If you take a text out of context, what you've got left is a con. And you're going to get conned. You're going to get deceived. None of us are smart enough to figure this out. We need a help. We need a teacher. So praise God for context. He is my strength. I'm strong. He is my joy. I'm joyful. He is my portion. I'm richly blessed. He is my Lord. Therefore, I am saved. He is my heir. Therefore, I'm one with him. He is, I am. And that needs to be a continual thread and theme throughout your life, woven through the fabric of your conviction or the system of what you believe. And then the last time I was with you, we discussed changed but frustrated and showed you how God called Jacob Israel. And believe me, he's called you blessed today. He's called you healed. He's called you anointed, appointed, ordained. He's called you richly blessed. But Jacob lived his life, and this is so staggering, this is so amazing. There are over 20 chapters given to this man's life. That's a lot in the Bible. 20 chapters plus. And when it comes to the hall of faith, Hebrews chapter 11, the hall of faith where God recorded the faith of God working in men, of all that time, 20 chapters, there's only one mention of Jacob. And that is when he crossed his hands and he took the blessing off of the first and put it on the second. That's the only time God acknowledged his faith. He had to raise Joseph up or else Jacob would have perished. Had it not been for God raising up some amazing men and women of God through the generations, the church would have perished. But he has raised men and women up to preserve us alive unto this day. Now it's time we agree we are the Israel of God. We could change this nation. We could change this state. We could change this County, we can change this city, we can change this church. If we stand as the Israel of God, you have power with God and you have power with man. After you've received the Holy Ghost, power will come upon you. And according to the power that works in you, you are the Israel of God. And I've lived about 95% of my Christian life changed but frustrated, aggravated agitated, things not working right, saying things like, it just don't seem to be working. I wonder why. And I've got a feeling if it's not working for me as a spiritual leader, it might not be working for some of you who follow closely the way that you want it to, change but frustrated. And so now this morning, we're going to deal with this thought, choose your freedom. You have a choice to make. And I'm calling you to a decision today of what you're going to believe and how you're going to correspond and conduct yourself in the name of Jesus. Take your Bibles, Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, 31 through 33. I want to show you something amazing here. Something that's far beyond where we are. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. Whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. And just above that, in verse 31, he simply says, You are of more value than many sparrows. He's in the context of teaching them how valuable they are. Now, this scripture, as I've always heard it and always interpreted myself, makes Jesus look very harsh. Like with him, it's either yes or no. And that if you deny me, you reject me, you're going to get in a world of trouble. Now I want to show you this morning that there's a glory here that we have so radically missed. That will shift and change our life if we'll get in agreement with this. Because he's glorified in this verse. He's not the austere, harsh, 
Savior that just cuts people off and throws them out. Well, thank you for your rousing applause over that one. <laughs> that went over, as Curtis Silcox would say, like a herd of turtles. Let's go to the board. Notes, please. The ministry of our Savior, Hebrews 3.1, he is called the Apostle of our Confession. Very important. Then to my notes, please. Now, the word deny here is aranome. Aranome. And this is the middle voice of the word rio, which means to speak. We get the word rhetoric from it. Rhetoric. Out of his belly shall flow is the word rio. Rhetoric. That's why when the flow comes, it has to come out of your mouth, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Rio rhetoric. This word, aranome, is the middle voice of Rio to speak with thought of contradiction in your speech. And if we go back to a deeper unfolding, if you contradict me before men, I'll contradict you before my father. That is glorious. Thank you, Jesus, for contradicting me. When I say I'm sick, you don't agree. Hallelujah! When I say I'm broke, he does not agree. He is there contradicting me before the Father. Hallelujah. I can't believe you're not on your feet. He won't agree with you in your mess. He's faithful even if you're down here talking all your stuff and all your mess and all your pain and all your misery. He will contradict you before the Father. He will not agree with you. He is a faithful high priest. He is there on my behalf to bring many sons to glory. He will not agree with me in my confusion. Now, the Greek word for confess is homogileo. And it means to agree. And Jesus said, if you'll agree with me before men, then I'll agree with you before my Father. Now, this looks like Jesus is operating based on what we do but let's give Jesus his rightful place. He never operates based on what we do. Because he's both bigger and far better than to reduce himself to live based on what you do or don't do. He has moved by a sovereign plan, a sovereign will, a sovereign work, a sovereign witness, and he will not change. As he confesses me there, I confess him here. I live in his confession there as his confession of me lives in me here. Imagine before the throne, Jesus is saying, John Cahill is your son. John Cahill is perfect with my righteousness. John Cahill is healed. John Cahill is blessed. And John Cahill's down here saying, Lord have mercy, I don't even know if I'm saved. Lord have mercy, I'm confused. Lord have mercy, I don't even know if there's any hope for me. And does he change because I change? No, he will contradict you. And in that contradiction, there is such blessing because he is faithful whether you are or not. Now I'm going to tell you, that is just radical. Well, let's prove it. Peter says, I will not deny you. And I really read through Peter's denial. He was something. Because he boasted. Mark 14, verse 31. Verse I've never really highlighted before. Mark 14, 31. Uh, Peter vehemently disagreed with Jesus and said, I will die with you. And then, Mark wrote, and this they all said. So he wasn't the only one that said he was going to die according to Mark 14, 31. This they all said. They all said, we'll die with you, Jesus. Big talk for little men. Big talk for little men. It's never a good thing when little men talk big. God builds a big man and then he doesn't have to talk a lot. He can talk a little. He say one thing and it's done. Jesus didn't have to stand there and command Lazarus to come from the dead for three days. Once was enough because he was huge. He was a man. Are you listening? So what did Jesus do with Peter? He intervened before it happened. He said, Peter, now listen, Satan desired to sift you as wheat. That's violent. That's brutal. Satan desires to tear you apart. He desires to rip you from, from stem to stern. He desires to tear you apart. 
But Jesus intervened and said, I've prayed for you that your faith fail not. And then Jesus not only prayed, He prophesied and He said, and when you are converted, that's confidence right there. Not if, and I hope you make it through, and I'm just holding on to the Father. You might make it through or you might not, but when you are converted, that's some confidence. You know He's not saying if, but when over your life. He's not saying if, but when. He's saying when over your life. Not if, but when over your life. Praise God. He's saying when you are converted, Rise and strengthen your brethren. Let me ask you a question. In the light of how we've been interpreted what's on the board, Matthew 10, 33, did he do that with Peter? Did he just kick him out and reject him? Or did he go to great lengths after the resurrection to say, you go tell my brethren and tell Peter I'm alive? And did he not get with Peter at the campfire? And did he not restore him, not rebuke him, but how did he do it? Simon Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? See, Jesus doesn't operate the way we thought he did. He's faithful there. He will contradict you. Praise God, you ought to be shouting this morning. He'll contradict you. Just think of all the times you've run your big mouth. Think of all the things you've said. And He's ever there faithful. No matter what you're doing here, He's there faithful, calling you what God says you are. He's there interceding on your behalf. Hebrews 7, 25, Romans 8, 34. He ever liveth to make intercession or to act on our behalf. He's ever before the Father. And Jesus said, praise God, I've got some good authority this morning. Jesus said, if you'll confess me, then I'm in agreement with you before the Father. But if you contradict me, I'm still in agreement for you before the Father. I'll not cast you out. He that come unto me, him will I not cast out. John 6, 37. The ministry of our Savior is amazing. And then I hear this, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. He will not change. I am the Lord your God. I change not. Malachi 3, verse 6. And before Abraham was, I am. So did he kick Peter out? Or did Paul write in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection and say he was seen of many brethren and of Cephas, who is Peter. He was seen of Cephas. Jesus didn't cast him out. Jesus didn't cut him off. And he denied the Lord vehemently. He disagreed with himself vehemently. He absolutely went against everything he'd said. And every one of us have done that. Now, Lord, I am done with that. I won't do that anymore. And you did it again. And then you came back and said, Lord, I ain't going to say that anymore. And you said it again. But your confidence rests in Jesus there because He doesn't change because you contradict Him. He will not agree with you. He contradicts you before the Father. Can we just take a moment and rejoice in that? Can we just take a moment and celebrate that? I have a faithful high priest. Seeing then we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast. The what? Confession of our faith. Having a high priest over the household of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water, and let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering. If we could ever learn this, regardless of how I've stumbled or how I've failed here, He does not fail there. And all God wants me to do is repent and get in agreement with Jesus. And then things can start working the way they're supposed to. Jesus said, I will contradict you. I'm not going to agree with you. I have prayed. And when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. I will contradict you. Now that made a whole lot of other passages make sense to me. How about Jude verse 4? Men creep in the church unaware. Men creeping in unaware. As though they come in on their bellies unaware, like a serpent comes. You don't know the serpent's there. Turning the grace of our Lord into lasciviousness. Which means taking grace and make it license rather than liberty. And grace will bring you to liberty. On the left side, what we would call the left or the, the open, what we call the the freedom people, they would be to the left, which is they have a, a, a liberty there or a lasciviousness there that God never intended them to have. And others come and for fear of the lasciviousness, turn the liberty into the law. 
And most of God's people either live somewhere between lasciviousness and law, and very few people live in the liberty wherewith they're called. But here's the word of the Lord today. Choose your freedom. Choose your freedom. So he says that you turn the grace of these men, turn the grace of God into lasciviousness, doing what? Denying, which is the same word, contradicting our Lord Jesus Christ. They're contradicting him. You're preaching grace, but you're contradicting him by being a fool. You're contradicting him, but here's some good news. He is not contradicting you. He's in agreement with the Father for you. He's in disagreement with everything you're doing, but he's in agreement with the Father concerning your salvation, your healing, your blessing, your prosperity, your welfare, your wholeness, your soundness, and your favor. He's in agreement, and if he will contradict you there if you're going to continue in your flesh and foolishness here. And Jude is a solemn warning that when we operate that way, contradicting him, that we become several things. First of all, we become a spot on the feast of love. Then you become a cloud without water, a tree without root nor fruit. You become a star without order, and you become a wave of the sea foaming up shame. And it's a crying shame how we've lived, a crying shame how weak we've been and how lacking we've been. It's a crying, just foam, foaming, foaming up shame in the book of Jude because there's a contradiction. We must stop contradicting him and start agreeing with him. Two cannot walk together except they be agreed. The ministry of your Savior is to contradict you when you contradict him. That's glorious. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jesus, for contradicting me as many times as you have. I'm sorry you've had to contradict me so much. I'm sorry you've had to be a continual contradiction to me most of the time. But oh, help me now. Let those days be over. Do you realize how glorious this is? How secure this makes you? Jesus is the guarantee of the new covenant. Isaiah 54, the covenant of my peace or shalom shall not be removed. He's there forever, beloved, and he's there for you. And when you're talking sickness, he's talking healing. When you're talking doubt, he's speaking faith. When you're talking disfavor and discredit and you're talking about what a mess your family is, he's saying they and their household shall be saved. He is contradicting you. He's faithful. Thomas in his doubt, did Jesus cast him out? Doubt is denial. And Thomas said, I will not believe unless I see. When Jesus came in the room, what did he do? He said, excuse me, excuse me, and pass right to the man that had the doubt. Jesus is always coming to you to end your doubt. And he said, look, Thomas, you see the handprints and, and the nails of the prints and the prints of the nails in my hand and my feet and my side. Now, believe, but you believe because you've seen, but blessed are they who have believed and have not seen. Jesus is contradicting you when you're talking and walking like a fool. Praise God. That's one of the greatest things the Lord's ever showed me. Praise God. All right, 2 Timothy 2. Let's turn there. Praise God. We're shouting this morning. I have a Savior who won't agree with my flesh, no foolishness. And He is faithful. Second Timothy. All right, here we go. 2.12. If we suffer, uh, we shall also reign with him. You know where that comes from. If we contradict him, the middle voice of this word, same word, he will also contradict us. There it is again. So this is not one text. This is all through. And I checked my references last night on this word contradiction, the middle voice, and it was multiple. You know, the computer is a very handy thing now. If you know what you're doing with the Bible program, you can find everywhere this word used in the New Testament with two pushes of a button. And it's multiple. And here it is again, this word. I'll contradict you. If we believe not, he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. And you are an heir of God and a joint heir with Christ. He that's joined is one spirit. So you are, Ephesians 5.30, you are bone of his bone and you are flesh of his flesh. And if no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he loves, nurtures, and cherishes it as Christ does the church, for we are 
bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, so that means I'm one with him. He cannot deny himself. I am part of himself, and himself is part of me. How wonderful the Spirit of God led our music team this morning. Did you notice again, the theme was, you are mine and I am yours. One together, you are mine and I am yours. Singing out of the realm of Spirit. We are one with Him. He will not deny Himself. He will contradict you all the way when you're in the flesh and in the fall. When you're talking everything you shouldn't be talking. He stands there before before the Father, unmoved, undaunted, unshaken before the Father because He believes what He did for you. He He believes the new creation. He believes His blood washed your sin away. He is standing there by His faith. And all things are possible to he that believe. And that one believes all things. I went back over my life this week as He began to teach me. And I cried. I wept. I said, Lord, I was so unfaithful. But you contradicted me. Lord, I wallowed in mud and self-pity, but you were so faithful, you contradicted me. And that contradiction, come on, shout with me this morning, that contradiction will bring you out of the miry clay, that contradiction will get you out of a horrible pit, that contradiction will get some healing in your body, that contradiction will bring a revelation, that contradiction will bring an unfolding of His glory in your life. And great is the mystery without controversy. And now what we want to do this morning is in the controversy. So might I just encourage you, choose your freedom and stop contradicting the Lord before men. Now the reason he wants you to do that before men is because he wants a witness before men. He wants a witness of his healing power before men. He wants a witness of his favor before men. He wants a witness of his anointing of the gifts of the Spirit before men. We're going to stop contradicting him. Praise God. How many of you are willing to go this far? We need some repentance. Now, I want to show you repentance because you know we really don't have a good handle on what repentance means. 2.24, 2 Timothy 2.24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. If you have a modern translation, it will say he must not be bitter, contentious, quarrelsome, full of agitation, aggravation, and anger. But be gentle unto all men, apt to teach patience. In meekness. Now stop right there. That's the qualifications of the servant of the Lord. Now we are his servants. And the story of the prodigal son who had the ministry of reconciliation was the servants. It was the right of the older brother who you can preach as a type of natural Israel. They ought to be putting the robe on us as Gentiles coming in. Because they had the covenants of promise long before we did. You look at the rich man and Lazarus, see natural Israel is a rich man and the Gentile is Lazarus with the dogs. You see a beautiful picture of it. And I realize there's more, a lot more to that story than I can say. But know this, that their hell began, their hell, that natural people, their hell began when he walked out and said, your house is desolate. And I leave your house desolate unto you. That's when their hell began. You search their history, their hell began right there. They fed lavishly. They had the covenant of promise. They had the covenant of healing. They had Jehovah Jireh, Nisi, Sidkenu, Shem, Arash, Shalom, Raphael, Shaddai, Elion. They had all that. What do Gentiles have? Nothing. At the gate of the rich man begging, crumbs of the dog, and even the the Syrophoenician woman, the dog. She said, even the dogs get the crumbs, and all we had were crumbs. But instead of them welcoming us in, they're out in the field, and they are absolutely missing God. They rejected their Savior. So here comes the prodigal as the Gentile. Here comes the prodigal. Here we come in. Dirty. God never intended us to be in a pig pen, never intended us to live. But the servants that are already in the house that are trained, they get the ring, the robe, the shoes, and they put the ring on. And they put the shoes on. What a privilege. You can put a ring on a man's finger in the spirit. You can put shoes on his feet. What a privilege. In the old covenant, Moses, that holy man of God, Take off your shoes for the place you stand is holy. In the new covenant, the man that was the mediator of the old couldn't stand in the presence of God in shoes. But in the new covenant, the prodigal coming in gets shoes on his feet. The prodigal greater than Moses. Help me this morning. The prodigal in the new covenant greater than the mediator of an old covenant. He gets shoes on his feet. That's your ministry. The servant of the Lord. Now let me encourage you. You can't be quarrelsome, contentious full of anger, full of bitterness, striving all the time, getting mad on the highway when you drive, getting mad at the grocery store. Oh, I'm not going to shout out of you now. Come on, help me. You got to start somewhere. Driving's a good place. 
I let a couple of cars go by down University Drive this morning. Teresa said, why'd you do that? I said, well, because I'm going to drive the speed limit. And I, I blessed them. I don't want them getting mad at me. So I blessed them. I let them go first. So I came up University Drive 35 miles an hour. And nobody behind me and nobody cussing me. Because I get cussed over there a lot. And I try to wait till everybody goes and let them all go first. Bless them. I don't want them cursing me, but I'm not going to get uptight. I'm not going to get in strife because they are. They want to ruin their day by cursing me. Then they can ruin their day. I'm going to bless them and bless him and just keep my day in the flow. The servant of the Lord, are you listening? Must not be full of temper, be temperamental. Must not, must not. Everybody look this way. Here's what Reese does. No, Papa. She says that to me. No, Papa. Must not. Must not. Everybody look. You must not. The servant of the Lord must not strive. No. Don't do that. You're contradicting him when you start striving. Let me ask you a question. Is he striving there? And you stop striving here. <laughs> Whoo, praise God. I can't preach myself happy. I came in here happy today, but I am a rich man in Christ. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. I'm a servant of the Lord, but be gentle unto all men. Let gentleness and notice the patience and the meekness, the three fruit of the Spirit, gentleness, meekness, and patience. Let these mark your life and a willingness to help anybody that needs help, your king priest ministry. And the ministry lies beyond the four walls of the church. We know sinners don't come to church by and large. We stand up too long. We sing too long. We sing about a Lord they don't know. We sing songs they don't know. We talk out of a book they don't understand. And we talk out of, out of a realm of dimension of understanding they don't have. So they're bored. It's no wonder they're bored. The real ministry for the world lies beyond the four walls of the church. If we never do anything beyond the four walls of the church, and it starts with you as an individual. God puts people in your path all the time that need some gentleness, some patience, and some meekness, and some instruction. And some of them are believers and some of them are sinners. But they need some help. And you're there to help people. The maturity of the servant. No striving. No longer striving. I'm at rest. I'm in Psalms 23. I'm lying down by the peaceful pasture. I'm well fed, well led. I am blessed, protected. I am peaceful in Christ. His favor is on me. His grace is abundant. His mighty working in me is sufficient. I'm blessed today. And so are you. Choose your freedom. Stop contradicting him. Here's some good news. He won't contradict you. He will contradict you there. He will. He won't cast you out, but he will contradict you there. It's good news. All right. Next word, the mistake the saints keep making. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Now, I gave you that little illustration there before we started the word this morning. This is what I've said about conference over the last several. Whoo, it's just, it's tough. It's hard. I tell you what, I'd rather preach ten than host one. Now what I'm doing is contradicting him before men. See, I just contradicted him. He don't believe that about conference. Now, the sad part about it is I'll have saints that say, I know it, Pastor, we're praying for you. I know it's hard. I got plenty of help helping me believe that. Instead of saying, Pastor, in gentleness and meekness, I tell you this, but you know you should rest. If you're going to have a conference, you should rest. You should come in here without a care, without a thought. You should come in here flourishing in the anointing. You should come in here abiding in the presence of God and not have a thought about it. That's instructing someone that opposes himself. Now just listen to yourself talk. Here we go. I dread going into that job on Monday morning. Lord have mercy. I dread it. I hate it. You're opposing yourself. And by the way, you haven't just said it once. You've said it again and again until it's a well-worn path. It's a rut. Oh, Lord, help me pray for her today. She is such a nag at my job. Well, I wish I didn't have her for a boss. Yeah. 
instructing those that oppose themselves. Do you know how many of God's people, and I mean probably, the, I would say 99.99% of God's people, do this on a regular basis? They do it all the time. So I want to instruct you to stop opposing yourself. Well-worn phrase. If you oppose yourself, no further opposition is needed. I've done more damage than a host of demons could ever do. I've tore more up and been out of fellowship with him more. Thank you for contradicting me. Thank you. I appreciate you being faithful there. I do not move you. Thank you. You move me. That's such peace. When you get that revelation, I don't move him. He moves me. I can't move him. He don't ever look at me and go, what in the world? He didn't do that because he is not moved there. Praise God. He's not moved there. So we've gone on and on and on and worn a well-worn path of sickness, of lack, of struggle. Well, that's time for raises, but bless God, I ain't got a raise in the last two years. and I ain't expecting one this year either. <laughs> oh, it's hard to understand the Bible. I don't understand it. I just can't help. I don't understand that. Pastor John preaches over my head. And he's contradicting you there saying, no, you have a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You have the mind of Christ and you have an unction from the Holy One and you know all things. He's contradicting you there. But you've got to choose your freedom. You've got to make a choice right here. Because we've all done this about our money, about our health, about our family, about our kids. Especially if they're wayward or estranged. I live in that. It's easy to do. It's easy to just get in that and wear a path and dig a ditch and then you end up living in the ditch and living low places instead of high places. But he never, ever agrees with me in the contradiction. He contradicts me there before the Father. And you know why he does? Because I'm valuable to him. Because he loves me. He gave himself for me. Receive that. So let me ask you this. What mistake do you keep making? What are you saying about your spiritual life? What are you saying about your mental life? What are you saying about your mind? My mind is clear. It's sharper. I'm more intelligent. The life of God's dominating my thought. The favor of God's dominating my mind. The crown Jesus wore of blood gives me a crown of peace. What are you saying about your mind? What are you saying about your body? What are you saying about your body? What are you saying about your relationships? What are you saying about your finances? Are you contradicting Him? If you are, here's the invitation. Choose your freedom. Stop the contradiction. Those that oppose themselves. And again, I tell you, I have done this over and 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 over at the point of nauseam. And you'd think after this long a time, 36 years of walking with him, I would have learned by now. But praise God, I am learning now. Praise God. Now, the next thing you see here is the mercy and supply of grace that God gives. Notice, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. That's the vast majority of the church. You go into church and start preaching to people they're healed, and they'll sit there and look at you as though you just said to them, Howdy doody! I've had people do it in healing school a thousand times, and I'm not exaggerating. Come up and say, Praise God, by His stripes we're healed today. And just sit there and look at you as though you said something as dumb as, Howdy doody, where's a red handkerchief? They oppose themselves. Remember Psalms 119, verse 162. I rejoice at your word as one that findeth great spoil. When I read it in the Holy Writ, I start rejoicing like I found some treasure. Because this is treasure because God confirms His word. It's the new covenant bathed in Jesus' blood. Now, pre-adventure. Now, I love this. God's ordained an adventure. It's a pre-adventure. That means God had a thought here to take you on a journey. God wants to take you on a wild ride where blessings flow and sick people get healed and lives are changed and people are altered and radical things happen and people start seeing God in you and on you and working through you. God has a pre-adventure. He's ordained a journey. He's ordained an adventure for you. It's an adventure walking with God. It's an adventure walking with God. 
It's an adventure. You never know what he's going to say next. Never know what he's going to do in the sense we know he's consistent, keeps his word. But he might just say, stop and pray for that blind man. Or he might just say, stop and tell her I love her. Pre-adventure, God will give them what a precious gift, repentance. 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 Now, I grew up in old-time classical Pentecost. And I thank God for my roots. But our repentance service weren't very glorious. They were ugly. They were ugly. On Sunday night, most of the time, the preachers that knew the faithful were coming back, they would rear back like a hammer on a Winchester gun. And they would bring the hammer down and they'd preach on sin. They'd preach on hell. They'd preach on sin. And everybody in there, by the time they got through, had a sin consciousness. Everybody in there was stirred up, looking for sin, looking for sin, looking for what they had done wrong, rather than looking to him who had done right. I look back now and think of all those services I sit in. I want to praise God. He was there contradicting every one of them. He loved those men, but he was contradicting everything they said because he's faithful. And when we got down to the altar, you talk about a mess. People in church, in those Pentecostal circles, of course, now a lot of the ladies didn't wear makeup, so we didn't have a lot of running mascara, but people cried ugly. I heard some wailing. I heard some gnashing of teeth. I heard people as though they were fearful of getting tossed out into hell, like there's a bus in the back going to hell, and you got a ticket, and you better get this right, or you're going to hell tonight. And our services of repentance were ugly, and what happened was, is out of that, because of that kind of thought about repentance, our testimonies became a, a, a report of our test followed by our money. Y'all pray for me, my washing machine broke, I got a flat tire on the way to church, and my husband is about half a devil. Y'all prayed, I hold out to the end now. Y'all pray. Test with a money. And our repentance services never got to the truth. He does not say here, repent and acknowledge your sin. Now, when you repent, acknowledge your sin. You know how I want you to acknowledge your sin? You know how I want you to do that? You know how God wants you to do it? You know how He's acknowledging your sin there? Father, I took the sin of the world in my body and put it on the tree and took it away. Have you not beheld the Lamb of God which took away the sin of the world? Well, if He's there saying He took away the sin of the world and my sins were in the sin of the world, then I ought to be here saying, thank you, you took my sin away. When you acknowledge your sin, put it on the tree. You never speak of your sin in any light except that's on the tree. He bore my sin past, present, and future on the tree. He bore my sins in his own body on the tree. My sins passed from me to Calvary. Praise God. Anthem of the church. I'm forgiven of my sin because Jesus bore my sin. I acknowledge my sin. True story. 1994. I preached a major camp meeting in the United States. I was there as one of the morning speakers. And this was the message. And you know I was a different preacher 21 years ago than I am now. And I preached... This text, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgression. And I was dealing in the Pentecostal realm and I had Pentecostals there and this is what I preach. You can be a glutton, you can be a gossip, you can hold grudges, you can be greedy and grumble and complain and be a great Pentecostal. You'll fit right in. And those people all but shouted me down. And I'm so sorry I showed those people their sin. I took their nose and put it right in what they were doing wrong. You're gluttonous. You're, you're, you're overcharging your heart with surfeiting. You grumble. You got grudges. And put their nose right in their sin. And the thing of it was, they all agreed. And there he is, contradicting the whole thing. I have a faithful high priest. Jesus said, if you contradict me before men, I'll contradict you before the Father. <laughs> and I preached that and they shouted. Now if I went back and preached, lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their sin, I say this morning, come with me. Take a look at an old rugged tree. 
I want you to take a look at a bleeding lamb. A lamb that's bleeding out of his hands, his feet, his side, his back, his brow, that has his head hung down, that is suffering immense judgment and pain. Look at your sin. Look at it and be freed from it. Jesus bore all of your sins so you could have all of his righteousness. That's repentance from sin. But here he says, repent and acknowledge the truth. The truth. Your mouth must speak truth. This gift of repentance is not so you can acknowledge what you've done wrong because that's all we've ever been taught about repentance. But true repentance doesn't stop until you have acknowledged the truth. And the truth is, if you're born again, the truth is, the Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you're a child of God. If a child, then an heir, heir of God, join out with Christ. And you've not finished until you acknowledge the truth. The gift of repentance here is a much more precious, higher realm of order. The truth is, I've repented of my sins. I see them. I've turned from them. But now the truth is, I'm made righteous in Christ. I am blood washed. I am redeemed. I am regenerated. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm clean. I'm holy. I have this amazing sense of being clean and holy and pure and right with God. I am redeemed and blessed with Jesus as my Lord. That's the truth. And until you acknowledge the truth and hold fast the truth, it's the truth that makes you free. Choose your freedom. Now, that's the gift. Notice, pre-adventure, God will give them repentance. Now, in order to take this journey, God's got to give you this repentance. This ain't something you can muster up on your own. It don't work because you're sorry. Because you've been sorry every time you sinned and missed it, every time you felt convicted in your heart. You've been sorry, but that didn't produce repentance that acknowledges the truth. He has to give you this. It's the gift. And it's in the supply of grace. The more His grace comes, the gift of repentance comes. That's not me. That's not who I am. I am not a pastor that gets it breaks out in hives every time I host a conference. That ain't nothing but a lie. Your mouth must speak truth. To the acknowledging of the truth. So let me ask you this. What truths are you boldly decreeing and declaring out of your mouth today? What truths do you declare and decree? What truth? What truth? Jesus is my Lord. My Father is greater than all. By His stripes I'm healed. God Almighty lives in me by His Spirit. My body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. I'm reconciled to men. I'm forgiven and cleansed. I've forgiven my adversaries. I've blessed my enemies. What truth do you hold fast to? Because truth in your mouth should be your normal. Anything that's not true should be an abnormality. It should only be there. And as you go, you grow. Take the adventure. Less and less and less and less. Because He's changing the heart. I'm acknowledging the truth. The truth is, open doors blessed. The truth is, this is an anointed church. We're free. The truth is, all of heaven is breaking loose. The truth is, we're filled with the Spirit. We're not only Spirit filled, we're Spirit thrilled people. Hallelujah, we're Spirit thrilled people. I am so excited to be a believer today. What a day to be alive. What glory in the Great Commission. What blessing there is. What favor there is. Father loves us. And in closing this morning, you get a manifestation of supernatural blessing. Supernatural blessing and favor. And here it is. Look at it. Put your eyes on your Bible. It's one of the hardest verses to believe in your Bible. Who are taken captive by Satan at his will. Last line of the verse. Who are taken captive by the devil, the accuser, at his will. Which means that he can come in and pretty much just shift you and move you and direct you with condemnation and with guilt. Because that's what devil is. It's a word that's traducer, one who stands against purpose. It is uh, diablos. It is a word that means to judge, to condemn, to find fault. It means to bring accusation. He's called the accuser of the brethren. And he says there that when you live without this repentance working in your life and acknowledging the truth, that your adversary can pretty much come in and shift and move you as he wills. Now here's what we've had. We've had the church moving and being shifted by Satan at his will. And that's what Paul meant when he said, we're not ignorant of his devices lest he should gain an advantage over us. 
you get two things. Now, I want you to get this. This is yours this morning. Choose your freedom. You get two things. First of all, that they may recover themselves. Now, this particular recovery is not you recovering Jesus. You've never lost Jesus, and he certainly never lost you if you're born again. But how many of God's people, including most of us in this room, are one thing, but we live another? If I would go further with the etymology of the word deny, it literally means, and we could go into this, it's deeper, I looked at many references, but it means to act totally unlike who you are or yourself, to be totally different from who you are, that they may recover themselves. That they may recover themselves. The Jubilee horn is sounding. To return to your own species. Your sons and daughters of the Most High God. You are the redeemed of the Lord. Your sins are washed away. Healing's working in your body. You have the mind of Christ. You're filled, favored and free. Full and blessed. That's who you are. Praise God. Now stop contradicting. Choose your freedom today. You recover yourself. And I'm finding these days that when I begin to agree with him there, and I begin to agree that I am favored and blessed and my soul's at rest, that it is easy to be light, it is easy to be free, it is easy to flow in the Spirit, it is easy to lay hands on the sick, it is easy to talk favor, and this is the outworking of my yoke is easy. To the acknowledging of the truth. That they may recover themselves. Do you know how many people have so sadly and continually set and lived and need to recover themselves? And then you are released from the infirmity of the snare. You know what the snare is for? Psalms 91, it's the snare of the fowler. It's to keep you low. It's to take the eagle and keep him in a lower realm. It's the cage of the eagle. And you can never see the glory of an eagle if you put him in a cage. You'll never see the glory of a lion in a cage. You'll never see the glory of a majestic whale swimming in a tank that man put him in. You'll never see it. And you will never see the glory of an eagle saint if he snared, thou art snared by the words of your mouth. You'll never see the glory of what God intended a new creature to be as long as we are snared. Low expectations, low thoughts, Low talking, low walking, low thinking, low praying. Suddenly like Jacob did, go buy us a little food. Go buy us a little food. But Israel, you have power with God. Buy us a little food. If we could just have a little anointing, if we could just have a little increase, if we could just have a little bit more finances, if we could just have a little bit of health, then we'll be fine settling for the snare of the fowler. I just decree over you in the name of Jesus. Get this right now when I wave my hand. You are free from the snare of the fowler by the Holy Ghost. I loose you to come into heavens to take your seat and sit with Him and majestically and in glory reign with Him as one in Christ Jesus. You are redeemed from the snare of the fowler. No more low talking and low walking and low thinking. Set your sight on God. Be filled with holy boldness and mighty expectation. You are redeemed from the curse of the law. Stand with me in Jesus' name. Praise God. Let praise break out. Hallelujah. I'm free from the snare of the fowler. Hallelujah. You're free from it right now. You're free from the snare of the fowler. You're free from the snare of the fowler. You're free from it. From low thoughts and low finances and low ideas and you're free, you're free, you're free. Hallelujah. Take a moment and thank him that every time you've been a fool, he's contradicted you. Just thank him for it. 
Thank you that you have contradicted me a thousand times. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that you are faithful. Thank you that you are such a high priest you cannot deny yourself. Thank you that when I was a fool, you were the wise. When I was low, you stayed high. Praise you, Lord Jesus, for my salvation. You are my salvation. Hallelujah. You are my salvation. Now, choose your freedom. All right, let's make a choice today. Here's the command of the Lord. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ... And notice, He didn't make me free. He made us free. That's for everybody in here. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, how do you get entangled again with the yoke of bondage? Just keep contradicting him. It's automatic. It's the snare. It's automatic. Well, I don't know about all that. (laughs) I can hear a thousand things in my heart today. He contradicts me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Because I promise you, there have been a few places that has been my only salvation. If it had not been for that, I, I know my enemies would have triumphed over me. One more verse. I will not be negligent to put you in remembrance of these things. We've gone over some of this before again and again. But I'm not negligent this morning to put you in remembrance of these things. Though you know them, now you know these things. You know you need to quit opposing yourself. You know you need to quit saying things like, Well, flu season's in there, I'll be the first to get it and the last to get rid of it. Stop it! Stop it! Get healed of the flu now, today. Get healed of it now. By whose stripes are healed. Though you know them, and here it is, be established. Give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Be established in the present truth. And you're established in present truth when that you just open your mouth and you can't help it. That's when you're established. And when you open your mouth, you can't, as one old country boy said, I can't help it. Just can't help it. He didn't, he didn't get his L in there. Just can't help it. It's just who I am. Can't help it. You know you're established in the truth when you can't help it. That man right there, he's going to talk the favor of God no matter what you do to him. He's going to talk favor. Why? He's established in present truth. And the flood tide of blessing is here. Grace and peace be multiplied to you. Man, you're rich today. Heirs of God, join heirs with Christ. You have sat at the table with Benjamin's feast. Now the question is this. What will you do with it? Be ye doers of the word. Not a here only. Father, in the name of Jesus, you're amazing today. You're great today. You're holy today. You're rich today. You are above and beyond what we can ask or think. I thank you and I praise you and I bless you. I give you glory. I'm so thankful. Thank you for speaking to me. Thank you for helping me. Thank you for showing me. I bow in humble adoration. I bow in honor of the Lord Jesus who's never been moved by what I've done he's moved by what he believes I hear the word of the Lord love believes all things bears all things hopes all things love endures all things love never fails and there could not possibly be a more perfect expression of love than Jesus There could not be a more perfect expression of love than Jesus. Your people today. Lord, give me, give we, give us repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. That we may take this adventure, pre-adventure, God will give them repentance. Give each one of us repentance. So when things come out of our mouth, you'll immediately begin to gently stop us. And say, John, that's not how I think about conference. That's a contradiction. I don't think about conference that way. He just stopped me on a dime the other day. I was telling somebody that about hosting. And the Lord just said, that's just a contradiction. And that's where he took, it was that statement that took me to that word, that he's there contradicting me. Oh, you ought to, you ought to be, you'd be amazed at what he believes about what's going to happen at conference this year. What, he, what he's believing, what he's saying before the Father. I'll confess you before my Father. So right now, give us this repentance. Give me repentance. Now make it personal. Today, help me to choose my freedom. 
that you bought and paid for. Help me choose my freedom. Help me choose my freedom. I thank you. I praise you. I bless you. And I give you glory. I give you honor. I choose my freedom. Help me in Jesus' name. Help me in Jesus' name. Help me in Jesus' name. Like David of old said, set a watch o'er my lips and I sin not with my mouth. Like David of old, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord God, my strength and my redeemer. Let your blessing rest on your people. Let your favor fill them, equip them, anoint them. And I thank you. They walk out those doors in agreement with you. They are not opposing themselves. And in agreement, we said together, amen. Our opposing ourself is over. You're redeemed and blessed today. Let today be a benchmark. Let it be the beginning of supernatural change. The altar's open. If you want or need prayer, need me to minister the Spirit to you in any way, I'm here to love you and serve you. God bless you in Christ. Ladies, don't forget 4 o'clock.